Established for us and calling us to be partakers of this covenant. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your love of your teaching of lives, Lord, and all that we've done together. Father, we pray that you will minister to us. Will you make an impact on the moment? Will you open our hearts? And let your hearts be good ground to receive your word. Will we ask the Lord that you will? Just bring forth wisdom and revelation, even as we spend time in your presence. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right. Let's just quickly do a quick review of what we did last week. Last week we talked about the names of God. Yes. Uh, we talked about how God is a God who revealed himself to these names. Right? Uh, so there was, there was many of names that we looked at, a uh, whole list of names. And then in chapter 3, we looked at the blood covenant, understanding what the blood covenant is, and who established the blood covenant. And when God established the blood covenant, he meant life for life. And he also meant that if he is willing to give himself fully for the covenant, we as believers must be willing to give ourselves fully to the covenant, right? But the best example we did last week was Abraham and God said, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, right? God told him this promise, but God told Abraham, now it's your turn. Let me see, people are willing to do everything that is there in this covenant, right? And God asked Abraham to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac, and we know the story. So, a blood covenant was established to Abraham. Then, another blood covenant was established to Moses and uh, to the people of Israel. We looked at the Passover. And then, in the blood covenant uh, that God established through the cross. Right? Then, in chapter four, we briefly looked at how God uh, has called us to be part of this covenant. Right? Now, being part of the covenant, God says, okay, you are separated, right? There is a distinction between you, or there's a difference between you and I as believers, and those who are not believers. Right? Now, when we look through the Old Testament, we see that when the Israelites disobeyed, what happened to them? Whenever they disobeyed, they went into captivity. There was failure with Everything that they did, there was a failure, right? Because why not? They opened their lives to the work of the enemy. Right? We look at the example of people of Israel, right? What were they doing after they came out of Egypt? Playing football. <laughs> what were they doing? Sorry? What were they doing after they came out of Egypt? Oh, no, so. Yes, they were worshiping other gods. So, what was the consequence of that? Sorry, what, what were you saying? Um, ah, what took 20, 30 days to complete it? God made it how many years? A moose all the time. Was it the Israelites' God? Was it God's God? Did God not have been more than that? It's God. Now, what would have happened if the Israelites said, God, 
no matter what happens, I think would have happened. They would have gone into the promised land. God would have still done those miracles. It's just that they would have gone on or you know, everything would have been okay. But because of their rebellion, and because of the way they said, no, oh God, what we will do it how we want to do it. I said, okay, go, you will do as you will. And we know that as believers, you and I have to say, no, I don't want to. That's not going to hold you to do. You have to do okay, walk away from God. But don't expect. The blessings of God come and me, right? Upon us. If we are rejecting God and saying God, of course, God still loves us. But we are not open to the things of God. If we are not open to what God is doing, we cannot expect God to you know, work in our lives. And right? so He draws a distinction. We are called to be a special, a chosen generation. Well, we must behave that way. And uh, when we do that, we overtake by blessings. Right? We look at that, right? Deliverance, protection, providence, grace, everything is there when we are covenant. Right? So, as common people in community, you and I can use God's name, use God's authority that He has given us, and we can walk in victory. But in the old covenant, Look at me. Talk about that last week. In the old covenant, David knew who he was. He knew his authority. He knew his standing. In the old covenant. So how much more you and I must know our standing in the new covenant? What does Ephesians chapter one say? We are seated together. We are seated together. We are seated together where? In the heavenly places. We are seated with him. So our authority is from him. Right? Um, so, very important. Uh, even as we have uh, closed on this chapter last week, remember that you are the covenant. The covenant will not change, you know what? Sound is echoing. There is sound problem with the audio. Hello? Yes. Yes. Audio yes. is not clear. It goes away. Is it better? It's still an echo. I hope it's better now. Uh, is it better now? Everyone online? I hope I think it's my echo now. Right? Is there an echo? Uh, voice is still the same. No, I can't change my voice. <laughs> you want me to speak in a gruff voice, softer voice? I don't know. Not audible. Okay, I think everything is fine here. Uh, uh, those who are here logged in online, is the all right. So maybe increase your volume. Okay, uh, everything's fine here from our side. Okay, all right. So let's go into uh, chapter five, talking about the new covenant, right? So now we talked about all the covenants that God established in the old in the Old Testament. Now, what is what is it? to be people of the new covenant. 
right? Let's read this. Matthew chapter 26. Oh, oh sorry, I didn't get the verse here. Uh, is that Matthew 26 and 28? Let's read that. Oh, is, is there an additional mic? Uh, just so that everyone can hear, if there's an additional mic, we can use that. Let's go ahead. Cheap. Chapter 5, the New Covenant, Matthew 26, 28. Go ahead. Read it from your notes. Okay. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Right. Okay. I'll just read 26 and 27 also. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the rem remissions of sin. Now, Jesus knew that there were many covenants in the, uh, in the, old, you know, in the old Testament. Now, what does he say? This is a new covenant I'm giving you, right? So Jesus completed everything that was written in the Old Testament was a shadow of the cross. Right? We've talked about it before. You look at the sacrifices. You look at everything that God did. It pointed to Jesus. Right? The book of Hebrews, it says, that rock which Moses struck was Christ. Right? When in the book of Joshua, he says, whose side are you on? Joshua says to the angel of the Lord. And what does he say? As commander of God's army. And he, you know, he's, he's declaring. So you will learn that in Christology as well. There are many, many places where Christ has been portrayed in the Old Testament. Now Christ, he's come into the world. He's manifested himself as a human being. And here he's saying, this is my body, this is my blood, and he's saying this is a new covenant, right? Let's look at Luke 22, 19 and 20. It says, he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. You do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. So what Jesus did was he typified everything in the Old Testament. Right, what is the meaning of typify? Uh, let's look at the example of Abraham. Let me look at even uh, the example, the covenant of uh, uh, what God made with Moses. Now with Abraham, what happened? God is take, uh, Abraham is taking his only son up the mountain. He's going to sacrifice him. And then what happens? God says, stop. Or I will provide. Look at the ram that is stuck in the thicket. Take it. Sacrifice it. A blood covenant. Blood was shed. And it was done. Now, when you look at it, translated to what happened to the cross. Beautiful resemblance, right? God took his only son. This time, God didn't stop the hand of judgment. This time, it was not a ram. It was the Son of God. So you see, God typified it. right? Even you learn more in Christology as well. Remember, the people of Israel are out in the desert. They started rebelling against God. They started grumbling. Oh, man, at home in Egypt, I had cucumber and I had you know, meat to eat. Yeah, there's nothing. This manna is tasting so bad bad they started grumbling and what happened they started turning to other gods god sent snakes the snakes started biting people people are dying and what did moses say god don't do this what did god tell moses bronze 
God told Moses bronze. Ah, take a bronze pole, take a serpent, and when anybody gets bit, you look at that and you'll be, you will live. That's so when you look at it, so much, right? Resemblance. It's typifying Jesus. Right? Bros means in, in, in the Old Testament, bronze is judgment. Right? The Lord Jesus became sin that you and I, when we look at him, we will live. Right? So a lot of typology there. And the cross and, we, and the, the rock from where the water comes. What did Jesus say? Streams of living water will flow out of you. Right? Wherever they went, that water flowed. Right? So all across in the New Testament, uh, we, in the Old Testament, we see the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the mediator of the New Covenant. Now, he inaugurated the Old Covenant. He ratified the Old Covenant. Now, he's also inaugurating, ratifying, fulfilling, and establishing the New Covenant. So basically, God is telling the people of Israel and everyone saying, okay, all that was done in the Old Testament points to me. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shed my blood. I'm going to sacrifice myself on the cross. I will take up all your sins. Right? What you, you know, you remember you used to go take the blood of the ram and go to the high priest. No, you don't do that. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my life on the cross. And this body and this blood will signify and establish this covenant. Right? Now, when Jesus said, you drink of my, eat of my body and drink of my blood, what did they say? What are you talking about? The Jews are so upset. Right? How can you tell us to eat of your body and drink of your blood? Right? This is cannibalism. It, it doesn't sound good. But what was Jesus trying to tell the Jews? You did, you did it in the Old Covenant. And you're doing it even now. Right? You're going and shedding that blood. You don't have to do it now. But the problem was they didn't understand it. Right? It was above their understanding. Jesus said, uh, you destroy this temple, I will raise it up in three days. They didn't understand it. Before Abraham was, I am. They didn't understand it. Right? Jesus Christ, he fulfilled everything of this old covenant. Remember what happened at the cross? Very, something very significant happened on the cross. After Jesus said, it is finished. What happened? Very good. The veil in the temple was torn from top to down. Now, this is not a curtain we have in our home. You just do like this, it'll move. <laughs> okay, this is in the temple, right? So they were made. So have you done the study on the high priest's clothes? The clothes of the high priest? And you've seen those 12 tribes and, you know, the, the, the material that they use. It's all high end. No, God didn't say, just go take camel skin and wear it. He made sure that everything was meticulous, everything was good. And he anointed people in the Old Testament uh, to make those, you know, the garments for the high priest. And here, the, the, the temple, uh, the, those curtains, they were not just one single curtain. They were very good material, and you can't just take a blade and tear it. It's not going to do happen, right? Now, in the old covenant, why was that curtain there? Because if you go in, that's the high priest there. The presence of the Lord is, right? So once in a year, this high priest would go. And at the cross, the curtain was torn from top to down. The veil was cut. Meaning what? Now, you don't need a high priest. You don't need this whole thing of the blood of the goat and ram to go in. You don't need it because I will be your high priest. So when you come into the presence of God, you don't come by the, you know, Hebrews talks a lot about it. Don't come by the blood of rams and goats and bulls, but you come through the blood of Jesus. 
we enter. We sing the song, no? I enter the Holy of Holies. I enter to the blood of the Lamb. Right? So the Lord Jesus is the Passover Lamb of the New Covenant. What was the Passover Lamb of the Old Covenant? Yeah, a lamb, right? So it was a Passover Lamb. They cut it. They put the blood on the door. Death passed by. Jesus became the Passover Lamb of the New Covenant. Jesus Christ is our great high priest of the New Covenant representing us before the Father. Every time I read this in the book of Hebrews, each one of us, it should really you know, bring shivers down our spine. And it's a joyful thing. Why? Imagine this. There's sin. Now, for example, we're going to pray. Right? And the God the Father is saying, hey, there is sin. Sin has to be judged. Right? I'm just painting a picture for you. Right? Sin has to be judged. Now, Paul, there's sin. So, I have to judge it. And all of a sudden, the Lord Jesus is standing there. And he says, Father, don't put your judgment on him. You remember the cross. You remember the blood that was shed. You remember the price that I paid. And it's like the Lord Jesus is standing there with the blood, not of goats and bulls, but his own blood. He's standing there and he's saying, it's like saying, Paul, come stand. You are righteous because of me and because of this blood, you can worship him, the Father. So when the Father looks at you, he's looking at you through me. And you are holy in his sight. You get what I'm saying? You understood? Right? So there is nothing that the enemy can say. Right? Uh, that, oh, no, God doesn't love you. God doesn't care for you. Let's read this. Hebrews 9, 15 through 18. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. The Lord Jesus is the testator, which means the covenanting one, the one who made the covenant of the New Testament, right? The Lord Jesus didn't say, okay, um, anyway, old covenant is there. No, we'll practice that for some more time. Uh, no, he doesn't say that, right? He says, hey, I've done it all. I'm not saying reject the Old Testament, but what I'm saying is you're doing all that because that points to me. So it's already fulfilled. Now, if you're going back to that, what is the use? What is the use of the cross? You see why Paul was so upset with the Galatians? He's gone to Galatia. He's telling, hey, Jesus is, you know, the Messiah. He's the one, you know, all that probably he explained everything from the Old Testament to them and then showed them how Jesus, you know, established this covenant. And then he goes back, uh, finishes his first missionary journey, goes back to uh, Jerusalem. Then he hears, hey, they're going back to uh, circumcision and, uh, you know, all the sacrifices of the old covenant. What does Paul say? You're foolish. It looks stern, but it's true because Jesus is has fulfilled that. What is the use of you going back there when there's something better? Right? So that's why the apostle Paul was upset because Jesus himself has stated that covenant and here he's fulfilling it right jesus sealed the new covenant with his own blood jesus is the mediator of the new covenant he sealed the covenant with his own blood that's why we sing no there is power 
wonder working. We have so many songs on the blood of Jesus. Right? Why? Because it's not that, okay, that's just regular blood. To look at it was just the blood of a, you know, maybe just regular blood that we have. But there was, there was weightage. There was power in that blood. More than, you know, in the Old Testament, they're giving the blood of the Lamb. God is saying, okay, I, I, I you know, I uh, forgive your sins for now. I cover your sins for now. It was just a regular blood of some lamb. But here, the son, the blood of his own son, how much more powerful that is, is this new covenant. Right? When we, you and I, uh, spend time in prayer, when you and I are going through things in life, speak the blood over yourselves. Speak the blood. Speak the power of the blood of Jesus. If the enemy comes in like a flood, the enemy is bringing trials and troubles, and speak the blood of Jesus. When you partake in the Lord's table, wherever, at church, at home, do it in a worthy manner. We'll talk about the cross next section, right? And the importance of the cross. The Greek word here for covenant, we've already looked at it, diatheke. The whole gracious and effective character of God's covenant in the Septuagint, uh, Septuagint is uh, uh, in the Old Testament, by the choice of the covenant, uh, and a, a diatheke is a will that distributes one property after death according to the owner's wish. It is completely unilateral. In the New Testament, the word diatheke occurs 33 times and is translated in the KJV 20 times as covenant and 13 times as testament. Right Now, it's not that we must know it. Okay, 20 times it is a covenant, 13 times it's testament. But if we only get this understanding of what Jesus did on the cross, and how he established this new covenant for us. The way we look at things in life will change. The way we respond to situations, the way we look at how uh, you know, circumstances come, will, everything will change right? because of the covenant. Jesus, when he established this covenant, the last point there, he establishes a better covenant with better promises. Everyone say better. Better. Sometimes we uh, we have a guitar, we want a better guitar. We have a drum kit, we want a better drum kit. We have a good laptop, we want a better laptop. Right? We have good earphones, we want a better earphones. Nobody's going to say, hey, no, no, I have, I have these earphones. That's enough for me. I always want a better one. Right? The Lord Jesus is giving us a better covenant with better promises. Right? Let's read this. Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. Go ahead. Anybody can read that. Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. It's on your notes. It's on your notes. No, just read it from your notes. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I dis discarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make 
with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none of none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Thank you. Right. So look at this. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, he's talking about what was written in the Old Testament. And he's saying now, uh, this new covenant that I will establish with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, in this new covenant, I will make... Uh, verse 10 says, For this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. Right? I'll put their laws in their mind and I will write them in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. What a covenant, right? I will write, I will put my laws in your mind and I will write them in your heart. Nowhere in the Old Testament uh, we see people, you know, the writing of God in your heart, in the heart, right? Meaning, uh, you and I as believers, right? We have the Word of God, we have the Lord Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit inside us to minister to us every time because it's better than the Old Covenant. What does he say in verse 13? He says, uh, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. The word obsolete means empty or powerless. But he's made the old one obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete is growing old and is ready to vanish away. Right? Hebrews 10 9 says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. You know, in the new covenant, we see so much. It's like God is giving us the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic covenant, all these covenants. And he's saying, I'm also giving you the blessings of the cross. It's a bonus, everything you take. Right? But we must know how to partake of that covenant. Some of the guidelines of the covenant remain the same. Which means what? If I walk away from the new covenant, if I walk away from the Lord Jesus, if I walk away from what he did, there's no more, there's there's nothing that you know we can expect God from but wrath. And there's nothing more that can happen in our life than failure. And uh, but we may think, hey, what about others who are uh, you know, their life is good, they don't believe in the Jesus, they don't believe in the cross, everything's going well. But it's not about you know, just blessings in the outside. What about a spirit man? What about forgiveness of sins? How do we deal with all that? Right? So that's a big topic again. But a covenant of grace was established. Now, I'm, I'm not asking you to do things. I am inviting you to receive by faith. Not by, based on law, but on work. Sorry, not based on law or on works, but based on grace. What is grace? All of us know this. What's grace? Second chance. Okay. Online students, what is grace? Ah, <laughs> Unmerited favor. How many of you have got in 100 marks, your past mark is 30? You've got 29 in school. Nobody. <laughs> and then what do you do? You wait for the class to get over. And the teacher comes out. Oh, sir. You go and stand there. One mark. Just give me one mark. And the teacher looks at that paper. Right? He looks everywhere. And he checks. OK, somewhere. Let me give this fellow one mark so he can pass. But there are some teachers, no, no, that's, that's final marks. Right. It's happened in your school. 
there are some teachers who are willing to give you five marks extra also. But, OK, since you didn't trouble me in the class, here's your five marks. You don't deserve it, but I'm giving it to you. Right? What is that? That's grace. Right? What about uh, you know your parents? Sometimes his parents, you know, we do things that will really, which is make them upset. But they still love us. They still provide for us. They still do everything for us. Why? That is the grace. Now, the Lord Jesus is saying, in the old covenant, they had to go search for a, you know, for a lamb or for a goat and all those sacrifices. They're coming by what? Works. Right? Okay, I did this offering. I did that offering. It's all by works. But here, God is saying, don't come by works. Meaning, don't come by any kind of work, right? Now, uh, yeah. So now, we may not come with a uh, goat and ram and all of that, but sometimes we come with our works. God, for two years I did Bible college course, so you have to bless me. Now, what are we doing? Works. Now, God is not interested in the, your two years of Bible college. The devil is not interested in two years of Bible college. Right? He is not going to say, oh, two years Bible college student, I would better go and tempt somebody else. No. He's not bothered about all that. When we come to the Lord, if we come by works, we will fail. It is nothing like we're going back to like the Galatians, we're going back to the Old Testament. God, I prayed, no, five days of fasting prayer. I prayed 21 days of fasting prayer. And I'm coming to you now. Why haven't you still answered me? So that means we are basing our, you know, God on our 21 days of fasting prayer. That's again coming by works. Right? Whatever it is, we come by the grace of God. Right? God will answer, God can, God, see, all these are important, right? The five days prayer, worship, 21 days prayer, fasting prayer, all this is important. But if you're coming to God's presence with that as your foundation, it's a very weak foundation. You can come with one hour of prayer, but come by grace. Say, God, I'm not worthy. But because of the cross, now, I am justified. My sins are washed clean. I'm still, may I, I may have sinned, but Lord, you forgive me of my sins. Wash me by your blood. And I know I'm standing here, not because of two years Bible college, 21 days fasting prayer, and uh, uh, two years MTH and BTH and all of those things. I'm not standing here with all that. I'm standing here because of the grace of God. So whether people call you pastor, prophet, apostle, uh, whatever, the things, reverend, doctor, all of those things won't matter to you. Why? Because you're standing in the grace of God. Right? This grace was sealed by his own blood. Jesus says, it, was the, it is my blood that is sprinkled before God and you. And there will be no need of a sacrifice. No more sacrifices. No more rituals. I like the word rituals. Right? No more rituals. You don't have to go to God and say, okay, you know, follow those old rituals. What? No. Now with the Holy Spirit inside you, you can pray at any time, anywhere. Just ask God to minister. Speak to the Holy Spirit. Right? Why? Because it's no more, it's no more a ritual, right? We don't need we don't need an image. We don't need a high priest. Right? They are pastors and all these are there and they can pray for you. They are to minister to you. But there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ, one mediator. Close the deal. Nobody else. Now this person may be a prophet and he say, hey, I went to heaven yesterday and came. Good. Ask him, how was the trip? Did he enjoy it? Good. But... Your response and my response should be one mediator between God and man. I can, you know, ask people to pray for me. That is biblical, right? 
uh, say, hey, pray for me. I'm going through this. But I'll respond. Like me personally, if I tell you to pray and I'm not praying, right? So I must come to God's presence by His grace, not by any works. Even if you, you know, any of you or any of them become a big businessman, rich, multi-millionaire, wonderful. It's God's blessing on you. But you and I don't come to the cross by our offerings. God, last year I spent 1.5 crores in offering. God, I'm not interested. I snap 1.5 crores can become can just come there. It doesn't matter to me because you're coming by works, and I'm going to burn it. And when I test it by fire, if it becomes ashes, 1.5 crores is gone. What about your soul? What about your spirit? You see what the difference is when we come by work. Because the reason I'm sharing this and emphasizing this is because as believers, it's very easy. To come to God through works. It's very easy. God, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. Will you bless me? Right? No. You come, you and I come by grace. Whatever it is, say, God, it is your grace. Tomorrow, if I'm alive, it is your grace. Not because I went to the gym, not because I ate well, all that is important. But it is your grace. I was just watching some of those videos that some of them have sent. Very disheartening. You know, the video of the uh, in, in Turkey, what happened uh, with the earthquake. Everything was fine just three, four days back. Life was normal, just like what we are, you know, what was going on here. All of a sudden, you know, this happened in a blink of an eye. There were families, there was a couple of videos where the there's a small child, baby, that is stuck deep inside the, uh, the rubble. And they can hear the cry, but they are not able to go in. The mother is dead there. Can we come by works to God's presence? Come by the grace of God. Every day you say, God, it is your grace that is sufficient. It is your grace that I'm standing here. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't do anything. Hey, God said, come by grace, don't do any work. No. Right? So we need to maintain a balance. Uh, we come to the Lord Jesus. Our identity comes through his grace. Nothing more, right? So a more glorious covenant, that is the work of the Holy Spirit inside us. In the old covenant, the Holy Spirit would come, minister to people and leave. You and I have the Holy Spirit inside us. Right? All of us have the Spirit of God inside us. Do we believe this? Yes? We all can prophesy. We all can pray for healing, working of miracles. We all can speak in tongues. We all can be led by the Spirit of God. What, is the, what does the Scripture say? Those who are sons of God shall be led by the Spirit of God. Right? We are led by the Spirit of God. We are sons of God. Both ways. Right? So as a child of God, we can say, God, you lead me. Leading of God is very important, no? Uh, I, I don't know if I've shared this. Uh, this happened many, many years back. But I think it was 2015. Uh, you know, we had uh, at Central, what happened was there was a, uh, there was a university uh, from uh, I think it was Texas, uh, Oral Roberts University, I think it was. Uh, they had come to uh, church and they wanted to you know, just talk about their uh, church and their ministries that they have. That Sunday I happened, I was leading at Central. So I finished leading the worship. Um, and after the worship, the, the Bible College principal of Oral Roberts University came up to me and said, um, uh, what is your name? You, you, thank you for leading worship and all that. Your name. And he, he said, I will give you, are you married? I said, yes. I will give you, your wife, three years scholarship in the U.S. Come. You'll have your own place. You'll have, uh, after the first year, you can start working. Yeah. But we want you to come and 
study there. Sounds good. Wonderful, it sounded. Oh, wow, India is, is getting bad to worse. <laughs> Better to go off somewhere. And everything is being given, right? Everything she said, you know, I'll give you this, 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 this. All you have to do is get your visas done. I'll send you the letter. Get your visas done. It sounds good to the ear, but in my spirit, I was like, oh. She said, why? I said, I, I don't want to come. I, I want to be here in India. No, I'll, you can come back to India. I said, I don't want to go. I just knew somewhere in my spirit, I knew it was not for me. And I look back and I say, thank God. <laughs> It's, just, it's good to go if you, you know, I'm not saying don't go to the US and go, go and study, go. But be led by the Spirit of God. Don't do things just because everyone are doing it. Right? Be led by the Spirit of God. Ask the Holy Spirit, God, is this something that you want me to do? Right? Take your time. Take time. Think about it. Now, for me, it was immediate. I just knew. I said no. And there were plenty of opportunities in the workplace also. Can you go there and work? Can you go? I said, no, no. I'll be here. I want to be here. Why? My colleagues would say, why do you want to be here? What is so great? I said, I like Bangalore. I like to stay here. I will stay here. My parents are here. And I like to be here. No, I'm not going anywhere. If you want, I'll go North India and come. Not outside India, I don't. Right? It, it's just there inside me. I mean, but I knew it was a leading from God. Right? Uh, I always share, you know, some of my some of them were saying, now, all my cousins, uh, like all my relatives, everyone have gone abroad. I think two of us are here. And the other person also may go. So why don't you come? Why don't you know our last Christmas they all visited us? Why don't you come? You know, one cousin is saying, come to the US. They went early 2002, 2003. So they're all citizens and they've all settled down. Come, come, just come. Don't have to do anything. Other cousins, okay, come, come. I said, all of them, I'm not coming. I'm going to be here. So what's so great here? I said, God is great here. I want to be here. So being led by the Spirit. And it could be, it not only this, but it could be in anything. Starting a business, starting your ministry. Be led by the Spirit of God. And you'll know, okay, God, this I know that this is God who's telling me, right? How? Because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Then we see the sign and seal of the new covenant. Uh, the seal is a new birth, circumcision of the heart. When the when we believe in Jesus, Second Corinthians five seventeen says we become a new creation. That's a seal that God has given us, right? The sign is the Lord's table. We partake of the Lord's table, right? Uh, in Genesis 13, Melchizedek presented bread and wine to Abraham. I would encourage you, if you're in your free time, go ahead and read that portion. We don't have time, but uh, it's, again, a type of what was going to happen in the Lord's table. In the new covenant, we have a new identity. Remember the old covenant? They'll do the offering, they'll go home and sit, or they'll go to work. Is there a new identity? No. Everything is the same. But here as believers, we can be the worst sinner. When we believe in Jesus, we're washed by the blood of Jesus. We have a new identity. What? We are sons and daughters of the living God. We are a child of God. That identity was not there in the Old Testament. Right? Then the new covenant includes the covenant of with Abraham, the new covenant temple, and the ark of the covenant. Uh, then there's spiritual sacrifices on partake, practicing the covenant. Spiritual sacrifices, including all of that we are doing now, prayer, uh, worship, um, you know, water baptism, uh, the Lord's table. All of these things are the things that we're doing in the new covenant. And the new covenant invites us to a place of intimacy. What does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? When you call to me and I will answer you. I'm knocking. I'm here to listen. Ask and it shall be given. Knock and the door shall be opened. A call to intimacy. We studied in Christian Leaders Conference, right? He wants, he's, we can pursue intimacy and he's willing 
to be intimate with us. Right? Imagine the, the, in the old covenant, those prophets and the great men and women of God, they were so intimate and close with God. Right? But you and I have can have a greater intimacy than that because of the Holy Spirit inside us. Right? You see the difference? There are some things they enjoyed. Right? Hebrews gives a whole list by faith. They did this, 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 this. And they didn't want to have the Holy Spirit. I mean, they had the Holy Spirit with them, uh, but not always. And they did all of that. But you and I as believers, with the Holy Spirit inside us, how much more we can do. Right? So there is a reason why God is giving us the Holy Spirit. There is a reason He wants us to walk in this integrity, in this power, in this authority that He has called us for. Right? So let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll continue with uh, chapter 6, the old and the new covenant contrasted.